now. Detonate the reality bomb! I will build a great, great wall. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The truth is out there. The military industrial complex. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know. Change has come to America. Catapult of propaganda. From a secure location on top of the ridge in the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, this is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Up until recently, it seemed that one of the greatest threats to Western civilization was a religion that began in the early 8th century. But now we're all focused on this little invisible invader. Um, How do we make sense out of that while we're still trying to look at a bigger picture? Because history will roll on once we get past this this outbreak. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me, a guest who's been on this program a couple of times before, and we appreciate his insight on uh, something I think that uh, will reemerge at the top of the list for national security folks once we get past the coronavirus outbreak. He's a fellow with the Middle East Forum, the author of a number of books we recommend, The Al-Qaeda Reader, Crucified Again, and most recently, Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West. He writes at his website, RaymondIbrahim.com, and we welcome Raymond Ibrahim back to the program. Ray, Ray it's, it's got to be a little difficult right now when you've got your, you know, the topic for which you're best known and something else is chewing up all the oxygen in the room. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, and as you pointed out right at the beginning, you know, there's various threats, uh, invisible, not invisible, obvious, not obvious. But the one that I often think about and talk about and write about uh, has has as all other threats been kind of sidelined by uh, COVID-19, a.k.a. coronavirus. But, um, you know, for the more holistic minded and, you know, far seeing people, obviously, we need to still keep these things at the fore or at least balance it all out and kind of you know, see how things are. So that's my euphemistic answer to, yes, uh, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of uh, space or time or interest in discussing these topics, but we should. Yeah. Well, the reason that we first got back in contact with you was we talked with you about a year ago when you were uh, invited and then disinvited by the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to deliver a presentation based on your book, Sword and Scimitar. And right. this year you were reinvited, and this time, uh, even though CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, protested again, the Army War College followed through and actually brought you in. How did it go? How were you received? Well, you know, that, that was a long, uh, you know, from the first invitation and cancellation to the second one. I think we got it, the first was in June, and then I spoke finally recently last month in February. Uh, so that was kind of a little saga with a lot of interesting developments and, uh, you know, lessons learned. Um, as far as the reception, it was actually very good. Uh, the War College and, and, and the folks there, my contacts were very good and professional. Um, Some of them, uh, including Heads Up, showed extreme interest and uh, very clearly seemed to be on my side, if you want to put it that way, um, to have me come and speak after the whole CARE thing happened. Um, And, you know, I do thank CARE for one thing, and that is all the free publicity and controversy created because (laughs) the room was packed. (laughs) And um, I even heard someone say, and this might might not be true, but the only person that – you know, got more of an audience than me was Buzz Aldrin. Wow. <laughs> who, who, who also spoke there. And, I, and again, it's not because it's me, but, you know, there was so much controversy behind this and it was in the media that naturally, you know, what, when you tell someone, hey, don't listen to that person or don't read that book, what do they do? Mm-hmm, they want to mm-hmm. listen. They want to see what it's about. So this is how CARE, once again, inadvertently helped create a packed room. This happened actually with me before in CARE in 2011 when I was speaking at a uh, – a community college in Seattle um, and care got wind of it and created another mass hysteria, but they actually went through with it the first time the college, they didn't, you know, they didn't buckle and it was free speech. And that room of course was just packed with people sitting on the floor. So every time care comes out and does this, you know, it actually turns back and kind of bites them mm. on the rear as it were. However, having said all that, you know, the, the fact that they even were able to shut it down the first time, um, is itself a problem, and the only reason I think that uh, the second that I was reinvited and brought back and, and all that was what happened in in the meantime, which is basically a lot of Americans once they got wind of this came very vocally in my support, 
the uh, National Association of Scholars, for example, which is made up mostly of its membership is mostly made up of academics and professors at, of, at universities all across America. Um, they wrote a, a letter and sent it to the White House, and it had five thousand signatures. And um, also, several congressmen, ten I have in mind, signed on a letter that was sent directly to the War College, basically criticizing how they canceled the first time. So obviously, there was a it, you know on the one hand, you can see how influential um, a surreptitious group like CARE, a subversive group like the Council of American Islamic Relations, which is connected with the Muslim Brotherhood and which actually is an unindicted co-conspirator of the largest Islamic terrorist case in history in American history. Um, financial terrorist case, and that would be the uh, Holy Land Foundation. Mm -hmm. It just shows you how influential it could be that they were able to shut me down the first time. And, you know, only only because so many people learned about it, um, because it was reported, including by you, and thank you to that. I'm very grateful to all the media that actually carried the story. So many people vocally came out, and you can see the decision was reversed, and it ended up very well because, like I said, <laughs> there were more people than I ever would have expected had care not done what it you know what it did um so yeah so those are some of the lessons learned on that road so what what was the crowd made up uh, who was in the crowd were these uh current military these uh cadets well, or what what who's at the army war college right so it was uh it was the it was hosted by a wing of the army war college it's called i think the army uh, heritage and education center which is almost like a which is what the name is you know they basically maintain the heritage including lots of military documents that i got to see actually behind the scenes before my talk and the heritage of the u.s military um so it was in that building right next to the army war college and it was open to the public. So it's really, I, from what I understand, you had a core of military students and academics. I, I mean, the head of the War College and the provost and all these people were sitting right in the front center in front of me after they greeted me. So you definitely had a core of military students and faculty. But because it was open to the public, I think the majority was the public. And that's, um, you know, the number, I heard various numbers, but one of them was basically as many as 300 people. So I would say mm -hmm. the majority of those 300 were probably just the public um but at the same time i saw people who wrote about it who were military people um you know uh, one person actually wrote me a very nice email and they summarized the event for me and she's a retired navy lieutenant colonel so it was it was a mixed bag but obviously more of the public considering how many people were there the feedback that you got after you uh, gave your presentation wh what was the reaction i mean were, were people how aware was the audience of the history that you recounted from your book uh, sword and scimitar oh they're not they weren't aware at all and that's uh, you know the one person because i ended up quoting her with her permission on my website uh the email she wrote and she basically wrote i'm one of the, the people who's actually well versed in the history of the u.s and islam and so forth and virtually all the stuff that you said i, I was shocked and kicking myself in the head because i didn't know it and, and, you know, this doesn't surprise me because that often is the reaction that including very well-read people have when they read Sword and Scimitar, which is basically, why didn't I know this before? Why wasn't I taught this in school? Because it's usually big things, including, you know, one of the quotes uh, that I quoted that I get is shocking to so many people is – and that's the thing. You find so many people that you never expected – historical figures talking about this so in this case uh theodore teddy roosevelt you mm -hmm. know u.s president one of the you know best known and in my opinion one of the presidents and you know he also was a historian and you know people aren't aware that he actually spoke about islam and here i'll give you a little quote that i that i quoted um, from theodore roosevelt's 1916 book uh titled fear god and take your part and he basically wrote this quote if the peoples of Europe in the 7th and 8th centuries and on up to and including the 17th century had not possessed a military equality with and gradually a growing superior, superiority over the Mohammedans who invaded Europe, Europe would at this moment be Mohammedan and the Christian religion would be exterminated. Okay, and so here's a you know here's an American president that no one would associate with the topic of Islam, writing in 1916 something like that. And by the way, that little excerpt completely accords with my own findings during my research uh, for the book, which is basically that you know at the time of Islam when it came into being in the seventh century, what was the Christian world or what became Europe was much larger. 
and, cent- and century after century, three quarters of that was swallowed up and became what we now call the Middle East, the Islamic world, the Muslim world. And all that was left, that westernmost appendage, was Europe, which is why it's called the West, because it was that last western holdout, Christian holdout, that never got conquered, or, or if it did, it was temporarily, such as in Spain or Russia, by Islam. Um, so there's a lot of things there that just most people, including very well-read people, just have no idea. And I think that's one of the reasons that Care, who was familiar with my book and its findings, was uh, very eager to suppress. Because these facts, once you know the history, all the questions that pop up today and that essentially uh, apologize for Islamic behavior, such as what went wrong, why do they hate us? These are all based on the idea that Islam didn't wage jihad on the West. Mm-hmm. Islam was peaceful. Islam was progressive. If anything, it was the West that was backwards, blah, blah, blah. So it's that fundamental premise that allows people to t- today to reject the idea that Muslims are doing what they're doing because it's in their religion, because they insist, well, they didn't do it before. Obviously, something went wrong. It's something we did. That's why they hate us. But when you look at this book and when you look at the true history, you find out, no, what they did now or what they're doing now is exactly what they've been doing for almost 14 centuries. Therefore, there's no need for us to ask what went wrong, why is this happening? It's just a perfect continuity of aggression and jihad, and it's unwavering. And that's why CARE and these groups are so adamant about suppressing it. Keeping us ignorant. Uh, two, yeah. two of the other presidents, and this blew my mind because I didn't know this either, and I've fairly well read, two of the other presidents who had some firsthand contact with Islam very early in the uh, the the new United States were John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who were trying to figure out why the Barbary pirates were waging war on us. What was the answer they were given by the uh, the ambassador from Tripoli when they encountered <laughs> well, him and said, "Try to figure out what 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 have we done to what have we done to you?" Well, it's it's funny you bring that up because I I actually just wrote about it because the anniversary, uh, not of the Barbary Wars, but of the actual letter that you're referring to. Was uh, it just came up on March twenty eighth? So today's March thirty one. March twenty eighth, uh, two hundred and thirty four years ago. Okay, Thomas Jefferson in seventeen eighty uh, six, March twenty eighth, wrote the letter that you're referring to, and it's basically the context is. Barbary Muslim pirates have been raiding American vessels, enslaving American sailors, parading them, abusing them, killing them, doing the usual. And now Thomas Jefferson and John Adams have gone and they're meeting with the ambassador from Barbary. Okay, And then after their meeting, he writes this letter on March 28, 1786, and mails it to Congress. And this is what he wrote, quote, We took the liberty to make some inquiries concerning the grounds of their pretensions to make war upon nations who had done them no injury, and observed that we considered all mankind as our friends who had done us no wrong, nor had given us any provocation. The Muslim ambassador answered us that it was founded on the laws of their prophet, that it was written in their Koran, that all nations who should not have acknowledged their authority were sinners, that it was their right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found and to make slaves of all they could take as prisoners, and that every Muslim or Muslim who should be slain in battle was sure to go to paradise. Now, can you imagine for a second what the people, you know, the men who penned the idea that every man is born, is endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, mm-hmm. must, must have thought of that explanation from this man. And you know, and what's sad about this is here's Thomas Jefferson and John Adams who obviously are so divorced and separated from Islam. They're living in America. Islam has become a very subdued power in in the late 1700s. They don't know anything about it. And here they're asking him and he gives the ambassador, he gives this perfect, you know, summary that encapsulates what Muhammad the Muslim prophet said, which is if you're a non-Muslim, you're an infidel, you have three choices, we wage war on you. Or jihad, and you either become Muslim or you give us your money, jizya, and you live as a subject, uh, or you fight to the death. That's basically what this guy said. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson and Adams just couldn't believe it. And yet you fast forward 234 years later today, and that still seems to be the dominant, uh, you know, uh, the dominant response by so many Americans. We just don't get it. Why do they hate us? Why are they saying this? Um, even though you have a group now like ISIS who spelled it out in no uncertain terms, who spelled it out just like this Barbary guy did, even more emphatically, and they quoted Muhammad and so forth. And yet, you know, there's this large domineering element in the American 
public that just refuses to accept it on face value. Mm-hmm. No, they must be twisting it. The, the, the ironic thing is that as brilliant as Adams and Jefferson were, and as much as they understood history, because the, the colonies, the United States, were not that far removed from the religious wars that tore England apart in the 17th century, but it was 1683 when the Muslims were at the gates of Vienna, which was only saved by the timely arrival of the King of Poland, uh, Jan Sobieski. <laughs> so it's not like it was really that that much longer before uh, no. Jefferson and Adams encountered the Ambassador Tripoli that the the Muslim armies of the Ottoman Empire almost took the gateway to uh, Europe. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of that has to do, though, with, you know, the Enlightenment and people like Jefferson. They just grew up in that atmosphere where it was never understood, where the ideological component, component, much like today, is sidelined, you know, during the Enlightenment era, which, as you know, had a sort of Mm anti-Christian bias to it and all that. So whereas someone like Jefferson may well have been aware of Jan Sobieski uh, and the Ottoman Empire, of course, he would not have thought of the Ottoman Empire as doing what it's doing because of the Islamic imperative. Okay, all right. It, it would just it would have been a war to him. Yeah, yeah. The, you know that um, empire was fighting with that empire, and he would know that. But as you can see, it was completely lost on these Enlightenment thinkers that there is this jihad doctrine that actually is um, impelling this sort of behavior, hmm. and it's and 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 that's sadly, I think, where we still are with so many people. They don't want to accept that it's just it that there's more to it than just you know uh human behavior warfare and that sort of thing that there's actually a codified ideology uh behind it hmm. well glad to hear that the uh, the army war college allowed you to give your presentation and we pray learned something from it uh, uh in our last few minutes here before I let you go, because, again, you're gracious enough to squeeze us into your schedule before another interview here. Um, Trying to write something relevant during this outbreak when, um, you know, the president is, (laughs) oddly enough, seeing his approval ratings really skyrocket because of this virus, uh, the the viral outbreak. Um, You wrote an article uh, about a week ago on Islamic hygiene and whether it prevents COVID-19. Are there teachers out there in the Muslim world, the clerics who are teaching their followers that uh, if they follow the the uh, uh, sanitation uh, protocols teachings of muhammad they will be safe from the virus well that's just it um you know islam is this is, is to be honest with you it's very reactionary and, and, and it, is, it exists sort of in a counterbalance to the non-muslim world so anything that happens in the non-muslim world that's sort of muslims can respond to or react to in a way that makes their religion look good, they always do. So the context of what you're referring to is the fact that outside of Iran, and I'll get to that, uh, outside of Iran, you know, the coronavirus, COVID isn't really, um, it it hasn't made much headway in Muslim countries, really. Not much. The numbers are nowhere near. Mm -hmm. At least at the time when I was writing this and watching what Muslim clerics were saying, it was very, very little. Um, So, of course, Muslims use that to say, well, you see, COVID is a disease Allah is sending against infidels, and it doesn't happen to us, and the reason it doesn't happen to us, and now you know not to question Allah when he makes you do things that you think are capricious, such as wudu'a, or basically the ablutions, the washings that Muslims are required to do Mm -hmm. every day before prayer several times. Um, Now they're saying, you see, that was done, so so those who are faithful to Islam and who pray regularly and therefore have to wash regularly are not getting COVID. And you see, Muhammad and Allah foresaw for you know they they foresaw this happening, and that's why they taught us to be doing this to be clean. Um, and you know, then uh, so we come to Iran. Well, what about that? And of course, the convenient answer is well, Iran is a Shia. They're heretics. They're not. They don't do it the right way, and they don't follow uh, the okay. exact Sunnah. They don't follow the Sunnah that Sunnis, which is ninety percent of the Muslim world follow which is the you know the words and the teachings of muhammad um as codified in, in all you know the hadith and so forth so well they had it coming too um now what's funny and what i try to point out is well if you really look at what muhammad did and what he what's recorded in the hadith and the teachings a lot of it is beyond unhygienic 
Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And it's just things like, you know, they used to boast about how when he would hack out and (laughs) hack out some phlegm, Uh his followers would take it and rub it on their face because it was considered holy. And they would take the the dirty water he used. And I don't know if they drank it or washed in it. And um, and then all these other weird, you know, things like Muhammad would say, um, yawning. uh, Allah hates yawning, but he loves sneezing. Okay, so imagine if you take that literally and people are sneezing and therefore spreading and blowing out germs, you well, hey, you should walk into it as a mist beloved of Allah. But yawning, which has, you know, it's completely innocuous to your health and mm-hmm, others, mm-hmm. is something to be guarded against. So it's just it just shows you the hypocrisy, um, but it doesn't in any way, shape, or form. That never dissuades the Islamist activist from trying to always show the religion as superior and somehow beneficial to Muslims as well, opposed to infidels who are plagued with COVID. Yeah, I, I was amused when I read that article because I remember back in 2015, just about the time Skywatch TV was starting, was the outbreak, the, the last outbreak of a uh, deadly coronavirus, which was MERS, the Middle East Respiratory yeah. Syndrome, right. which was uh, a virus similar, but uh, translate, transmitted from camels. And there was right. a, a teaching going around in Saudi Arabia, if I remember correctly, that if you drank camel urine, you, you would... Yep. Uh, and that teaching is based, again, on an authentic hadith or saying or, you know, teaching of Muhammad who said basically drinking camel urine is beneficial to you. And it's something that still happens all across the Islamic world. And I do believe that when that, you know, that coronavirus strain you're referring to, you're referring to MERS, broke out, it was, and it was, I mean, scientists, you know, they made it clear it has to do with, it comes from camels. And we know you have Muslims who are drinking camel urine, especially in the homeland of Muhammad in Arabia. And then this breaks out. Mm-hmm. And by the way, this was a lot, you know, the uh, mortality rate was much worse. Right. I think it was 40%. Yeah. So, you know, 40% of those who got it actually died. Um, and yet here, you know, here are Muslim propagandists saying, ah, see, our religion teaches us to be nice and clean. And you guys are suffering from COVID despite all of these, uh, you know, background as- aspects. Mm. How I wanted I no. wanted to um, you know just give you a few more quotes while we were at it about you know famous people because sure in front sure of me. Uh, you know we were talking about how I always find it interesting all these people of history especially well known people of Western history that we know uh, you know such as Roosevelt Teddy Roosevelt um, and then you find that they had something to say about Islam which by today's standards would be considered Islamophobic mm-hmm. okay so here's a uh, Here's Alexis de Tocqueville. I may not be, you know, I may not be pronouncing his name correctly. Tocqueville, mm-hmm. uh, and he was a French political thinker and philosopher, best known for the book that he wrote, "Democracy in America." And he died in 1859. Okay, so he wrote this quote: "I studied the Quran a great deal. I came away from that study with a conviction that, by and large, there have been few religions in the world as deadly to men as that of Muhammad. Hmm. As far as I can see." It is the principal cause of the decadence so visible today in the Muslim world and, though less absurd than the polytheism of old, its social and political tendencies are, in my opinion, more to be feared. And I therefore regard it as a form of decadence than a form of progress in relation to paganism itself. And here's Winston Churchill. Uh, you know, I don't have to explain who he is. Mm-hmm. Winston Churchill, uh, around 1965, he wrote, quote, How dreadful are the curses which Mohammedanism, and that's the old-fashioned way of saying Islam, lays on its votaries. Besides a fanatical frenzy, which is as dangerous in a man as hydrophobia in a dog, there is this fearful, fatalistic apathy. The effects are apparent in many countries. Improvident habits, slovenly systems of agriculture, sluggish methods of commerce, and insecurity of property exist wherever the followers of the prophet rule or live. A degraded sensualism deprives this life of its grace and refinement, the next of its dignity and sanctity. The fact that in Mohammedan law or Sharia, every woman must belong to some man as his absolute property, either as a child, a wife, or a concubine, must delay the final extinction of slavery until the faith of Islam has ceased to be a wow. great power among men. Wow. Isn't that amazing that these wow. guys that, you know, uh, you'll never know they said all this. And yet these words that I just quoted, I mean, this is beyond Islamophobic. Um, and yet, you know, we know today when we look and we compare what we're seeing, if we're honest with ourselves and we look at the history of Islam and the current affairs, well, the, these words are not <laughs> as sad as they may be. And, you know, unfortunate and, um, 
uh, you know, not not at all complimentary to Muslims, but you can obviously see the facts and the truth behind them. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that uh, his attitude towards Islam was not part of the movie with uh, Gary Oldman. <laughs> of course, that was focusing. Maybe that was later. You know, he was that focused on World War II, but uh, right. yeah, that he actually compared it to rabies. Right. Wow. <laughs> now, even I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. That yeah that that is incredible. Um, yeah, the, what really struck me in your book is look at, looking at these these battles that took place, and some of which I'd never heard of. I had never heard of the Battle of Yarmouk before, and, and maybe we can close on this just to kind of reiterate how significant these turning points have been in history. The Battle of the Yarmouk, which is the river that runs uh, into the Jordan just south of the Sea of Galilee, so it's uh, basically the southern border of the Golan Heights. Um, very early in Islam's history, not long after the death of Muhammad. Uh, so, you know, what about, was it 636 AD? Do I remember? Right? Yeah, yeah, 636. Okay. And to find that it's been described by military historians as one of the five most significant battles in the history of the world. What was it that made that battle so important? Well, first to give you, a, you know, to confirm what you're saying, uh, here's a his well-known historian, uh, you know, 20th century historian, um, and his name is uh, <clears throat> Franco Gabrielli. And he wrote this, quote, about the Battle of Yarmouk. He wrote, quote, the Battle of the Yarmouk had, without doubt, more important consequences than almost any other in all world history. Now, imagine that. Um, and this, as you just correctly pointed out, is one of the battles that even military historians seem to forget about. So mm-hmm. why, what made it so important is the fact that uh, this is the first major battle between Islam and, well, what we would call the West, or basically the Christian world in the guise of the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire. Mm-hmm. And at the time, Egypt and all of North Africa uh, and the Middle East, Syria, and of course, what we call Turkey or Anatolia, Asia Minor, all that was part of the Christian world. And it was actually the heart of the Christian world, much more so than Europe proper. Um, and again, you know, people forget that. So after the Battle of Yarmouk, which happened in Syria, essentially the floodgates opened and uh, and the Eastern Roman Empire could not hold back. And so like dominoes, uh, after that, uh, the Muslims went into Egypt and, you know, five years later, Egypt was conquered. And then they slowly spread out into Libya and all the way um, to Morocco. And, uh, you know, they conquered them permanently. And Arabize them. You know, we forget today when you say the Arab world, of course, you think of Egypt and mm-hmm. Syria mm-hmm. and Libya and Morocco. There's only one Arab nation. That's what we call Saudi Arabia. And that's where the language Arabic comes from. But today you have 22, I think, Arab nations because you have 22 nations that were conquered and Arabized. And now the first language, often the only language in those countries is Arabic. Right. Um, and of course, that wouldn't be the case. You know, Egyptians spoke their own language. Syrians had their language. Um, you know, the, the Berbers had their language. They had mm-hmm. their cultures. And most of those peoples were Christian uh, and part of the empire. And so that's the battle that after it, as I was saying, three quarters of what was the Christian world slowly got conquered piecemeal um, until Muslims, let, well under 100 years after the Battle of Yarmouk, I think something like 70 years, they were in France and Spain had already been conquered. Um, and, and um, you know, there was a base in Switzerland in the, in, in the Alps where Islamic raiders would go looking for slaves to take them to the markets and so forth. It's so, astonishing. Yeah. It's a, it is astonishing. What, yeah. what, and, I mean, and how other, many people know it, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I've got Swedish ancestry uh, on my father's side and uh, come to find out in your book that uh, the Vikings probably started Viking because there was a demand for slaves from Europe and uh, right. the Vikings were raiding and stealing women to take to uh, Muslims. We always, you know, the- historians and, and people are familiar that the Vikings would enslave people from, you know, England and, 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 the coast, uh, and the coast of mainland Europe. What they don't know is it wasn't so much for the Vikings as much as it was f- because they got top dollar from the Arabs uh, and the caliphates down south. Mm-hmm. And they would take, take it down the Volga River um, and by the Black Sea. That's where you had all the main trading would happen. Um, so yeah, it's uh, all these little hidden aspects, you know, that all are all interconnected, um, and so many people either don't know about them or they know them disparately. They just know them in and of themselves, kind of mm-hmm. like the Viking phenomenon. Um, you know, Christopher Columbus. Uh, how many people know he actually the whole purpose of his sailing west 
wasn't because he wanted to discover or you know new lands or he was going to prove the world is round or any of that. It was to bypass what Muslims were doing in the Mediterranean and to try to get to the east and actually get some allies. You know, there was this myth, uh, Prester John, right, great right. Christian, right, Christian uh, monarch who lives far in the east, and they wanted to reach him and create an alliance and fight Islam in between them. Uh, and, and you see that in the letters from Christopher Columbus to Ferdinand and Isabella. That's what he's talking about. That's what the focus is. But, of course, all that's gone out of our consciousness, and we're just told, you know, the, the mainstream story that he sailed west for all the other reasons. Um, so it's surprising how, um, you know, how much of an impact Islam had, above and beyond the obvious, you know, yeah. jihad and conquest, the subtle impact that it had on the development of the Western world. And it's so unknown by most people. Yeah, absolutely astonishing. Sword and Scimitar is Raymond Ibrahim's most recent book, but his others include Crucified Again, the Al-Qaeda Reader, and uh, the Battle of Yarmouk, if you re- want to read about that specifically. But you'll see, you'll read about that and a number of other key battles that took place between Islam and the West in his most recent book. His website, RaymondIbrahim.com. Uh, thanks again for taking some time out today, and uh, we look forward to talking with you again soon. My pleasure, Derek. Thanks for having me. Look forward to it. His website is RaymondIbrahim.com. You'll find a link in the notes below this program. And uh, do check him out. He's one of the few voices out there in our culture who is uh, speaking up about the ongoing threat posed by Islam as a religion. And (laughs) I believe him. Otherwise, I wouldn't have written the book, Bad Moon Rising. Um, A thankless job because right now uh, his work is narrowly focused and right now everybody wants to hear about COVID-19. And to that end, when we come back, we talk with Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat, an interview we recorded earlier this week for Skywatch TV and how this outbreak is affecting his ministry. In other words, what opportunities is it opening for people to listen to the gospel when they would not hear it before? Zev Porat, Messiah of Israel Ministries, straight ahead on A View from the Bunker. Unveiling the ancient realms of demonic kings and Satan's battle plan for Armageddon. Skywatch TV is proud to announce two new special offers. The Veneration Collection with optional Red Wing Saga series. Sold separately, this exclusive offer retails for $90. Yours now for only $35 plus shipping and handling. But wait, now you have the option to upgrade and expand your collection by including all five previously released books in the Red Wing Saga. The expanded collection, which includes all eight books and the Search for the Rephaim DVD documentary, holds a retail value of $190. Yours now for your donation of only $100 plus shipping and handling. So don't delay. Order the Veneration Collection with optional Red Wing Saga series now. Available at Skywatch tvstore.com or call 1-844-750-4985. Talking the walk every Sunday night from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is a view from the bunker online vftv.net where we've got links to our free mobile app. It's good for Android and iOS devices. You'll find links to those app stores at vftb.net. Also links to our social media accounts on Twitter at View From Bunker or at Derek Gilbert. Our Facebook page, View From The Bunker. And uh, you'll find us on other uh, social media sites as well. Parlay.com, that's P-A-R-L-E-R, SaviorConnect.com, and Gorf.Social under the user handle Derek P. Gilbert. COVID-19 is definitely top of everyone's mind right now and um for most of us self-included that means we're thinking about how it's affecting us but really as christians we need to be looking outward and asking the lord how do we use this as an opportunity for ministry and to that end we turn to our good friend messianic rabbi zev porat who lives in tel aviv very close to one of the centers of the outbreak in israel b'nai brak That's a community, in fact, it's his hometown. It's a community of Haredi Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews. And by one estimate this week from a medical group, a health maintenance organization, HMO, that operates in um, B'nai Brek, as many as as 40% of the people in that community may be infected, which, which, if it's true, means 75,000 people in that community have the disease. Now, bear in mind, the official statistics as of right now in Israel is that only uh, 
eight thousand. There are only eight thousand cases officially in all of Israel. Seventy five thousand in Bene Brak alone, an ultra orthodox community that has been very hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ and pretty hostile to Sev personally because he was expected to become a rabbi from this community. When he turned his back on his what was believed to be his destiny, he um, burned a lot of bridges in that community that now COVID-19 appears to be reopening. So, in an interview we recorded for Skywatch TV earlier this week, Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat. Good to see you again, brother. It's an honor to be here. This uh, has been an interesting time, and and things have really changed quite a lot here in the last uh, 30 days or so. We had expected to see you at the end of this month as part of a research trip. Uh, Obviously, that's not going to happen now, at least not uh, when we thought it would. Um, But we're seeing, as uh, as this virus continues to spread across the world, spreading in Israel, spreading here in the United States, uh, just curious as to uh, how this is affecting things in Israel, both uh, for you on the ground, uh, and I ask that because we've heard reports coming from the church in China, and I know you've got some contacts with the underground church there as well, that uh, COVID-19 is actually opening some doors for ministry. How has this been affecting your work? Well, it's affecting the whole world, but you know, you mentioned about you uh, having to meet us here in Israel. And I think that uh, I want to touch a little bit on that because we make a lot of plans and it's good to make plans, ministry plans. But I think God is showing, allowing this evil to happen in order to show us that you can make all the plans you want, but things can change overnight. Right. And I think it's important for us to realize that as we're in the end times getting closer to the second coming of Jesus Yeshua, we need to recognize we don't have any time because things can just flip and change you know, in overnight as, as we spoke uh via email, the world is turned upside down. And I think the world is turned upside down also here in Israel. What you're seeing in America, you're seeing also in Israel. People are panicking. Uh, people don't know, uh, you know what's going to be tomorrow. But having said that, the doors in Israel have been opened for the gospel to go forth because I think many, many people who lost hope in God, who lost faith in God, even here in Israel, our, our ministry is in position in a place to show them who God is, that it's Yeshua the Messiah, and they're listening right now in the midst of this coronavirus. So God is using this for good. Uh, Israel has been uh, quarantined, most of the country, for over over 70% of the country has to stay home. 10% of the country can go to work, you know, basic uh, jobs, uh, police, uh, you know, people that are working in jobs that are, you know, humanitarian jobs uh, can be opened, but at a very low rate. The police are checking the highways day and night, and you have to have a pass, a license to go out. You can't just go out unless you're going in your neighborhood to a supermarket. Well, they're looking for volunteers to give money, to give uh, food uh, to Holocaust survivors, to oh, sure. widows, to just elderly people that can't leave the house because they're so vulnerable to this virus. And so our ministry called up uh, the uh, municipality and said, we want to volunteer for this. Well, we called as not as the ministry, but as, you know, as Zev, as Ronan, as the people in the ministry. And they're so, so, so tight. They don't have time to do a background check. And they said, okay, we're giving you the license. So we have license to travel in Israel on the highways, bring food to people. And in the midst of it, preach the gospel, even to the police that stop us on the way and say, where are you going? Where is your, where is your license to go out right now? We show them this and have an opportunity to share with them. And to share with their loved ones and even give some policemen some masks that because uh, they were asking, do you have any extra masks? Sure, we'll give you some masks because, you know, praise God, the uh, the, the Chinese church, you mentioned the Chinese church, were, were able to send thousands upon thousands of masks to Israel. They really? blessed the, the people. They sent it to our ministry. So we're able to give it to people, give it to the police, hand it out to people. And in the midst of, of giving out these uh, masks, we're able to share the gospel. So God is using this coronavirus uh He's not, God is not the one who orchestrated the coronavirus, but God can allow it. He knew it's going to happen. It didn't take God by surprise, let's put it that way. Sure. God knew what's going to happen, and God's using it now for good. So we're looking at the good in, in, in this evil world and how to how to preach Jesus. Th- that's really remarkable because the Chinese church, as you know better than we do, you know, your lovely life, wife Lynn is, is from China, Th- that... Uh, they have really endured persecution that that we in the West 
uh, you know, just really, we don't have a frame of reference to understand what they've been going through for years, under, especially in the recent years. I've heard from a couple of missionaries in China that uh, ever since President Xi took power, um, things have gotten more difficult for the church in China. And uh, even in Wuhan, which was the center of, of this outbreak, uh, they have found opportunities to uh, witness, to share, to show the love of Jesus Christ at a time when people are afraid and concerned. But I think that's really remarkable that the church in China is turning around and blessing your ministry in Israel by sending the, the uh, protective gear for you to bless God's people, the Jews. Uh, I think that's an incredible story. It's incredible because just last night on the Israeli news, uh, the, uh, the health department of Israel announced, okay, we, we recommend that everyone wear a mask when they go out. They didn't say that last month. They're saying it now. Now is the recommendation. As soon as the masks arrive to Israel, it's not going to be a recommendation anymore. It's probably going to be, you know, the law. You need to go out with a mask. And there's not enough masks. And the masks that they do have in Israel, they're overpricing them at crazy prices. They're selling here 20 to $25 a mask in the pharmacy, and people are buying it just for one mask. I mean, they're just abusing uh, the whole system on the black market here. So the Chinese church is recognizing it. They've, been, they've gone through it. They, they needed masks themselves. Now they have enough masks. They're sending them to Israel. And it's, it's beautiful to see uh, how the body is blessing each other. And we also have an opportunity to tell the, the people in Israel. A lot of people in Israel are saying, oh, you know, this thing started in Nuan and, and, you know, it started from a bat. It may well have started out from a bat. We don't know. Right. But it kind of put a little bit anger in some of the people here in Israel that are saying, you know, towards the Chinese people, a little mm-hmm. bit. You know, they had a, a, a situation in Tiberias last month where there was a Chinese uh, a boy that was actually born here in Israel that got beat up in the street uh, because they thought, you know, you're responsible for what's happening. Yeah, yeah. So what, right now, God is using the Chinese congregation in order to say, wait a minute, these Chinese people love you. They're sending you the masks. So that's even opening, uh, you know, the, the restoration between in that aspect as well, too. And the Orthodox city of Nebrak, where I grew up as a boy, yes. right now they're having serious problems there with that. They're, they don't want to get quarantined, and they're not obedient to, to, the, to the news. Well, one of the reasons they're not obedient to the news, Derek, is because they don't have news. They don't have television. Right, right. They don't have newspapers. They live in their own communities. And right now the rabbis are the ones who are going out and telling the people, you need to stay in your home. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, you're going to die. It's kind of difficult for them to stay in their home. If you have eight or ten kids in a very small apartment, how do you keep the people at home? But having said that, one of the main rabbis in Bnei Brak today, his wife passed away yesterday from oh. the coronavirus. That triggered a big, uh, a big warning in the community. So they're going in their homes right now. Uh, our ministry has gone into that city uh, and preached the gospel to them and brought them a lot of masks and uh, and, and food vouchers and things like that. So uh, hopefully through this, they'll come to know Messiah Yeshua. Praise God. Now, I, I noticed that story because I remember that that is your hometown. And uh, the story was about how serious the uh, the virus has spread through that community. It's it's really uh, a hotbed in Israel, a center for the outbreak of B'nai Brak. Um, how is your reception different when you go back now with masks and food and uh, and the gospel compared to when you went home before? Well, first of all, I'm going in with a mask right now because they require me to. So right, they don't. Right. Not everybody recognizes me so easy. <laughs> okay, that's all number, right. <laughs> that's number one. Number two. <laughs> so that that's helpful. But we're able to get into the homes and bring them boxes of food and some people food vouchers, some boxes of food. Uh, and, and able to, uh, to gently to share the love of Yeshua, of Jesus, because they do ask us, you know, why are you doing this? What organization are you coming from? We're saying we're not coming from any organization. We're coming from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you want to know who he is? Yeah. And this yeah. opens the door. You know, when Pete, it's very hard for people to see God in a storm. But it's when they often call out to God. You know, you think about the story of... Uh, Uh, The account in the Bible where Jesus walks in the water, they didn't recognize him because it was a storm. Mm -hmm. It's hard to recognize God in the storm. Hmm. But I think if we bring it out, this is where where the gospel can go forth. Having said that, the Bible is clear. We're not to have a spirit of fear. The Bible says in in 2 Timothy uh, 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And I think that's what 
the body right now needs to do is use this opportunity to be a witness wherever you are, wherever God has positioned you to be. Amen. And uh, from the beginning of time, knowing the end from the beginning, he chose you, me, and all of the people hearing or seeing this message to be alive at this time, in this hour, and for this purpose. Uh, One final question, uh, Zev, because uh, this was kind of a surprise last week as we just get back to the politics, sort of the mundane uh, news of the day. Benny Gantz broke up the Blue and White Alliance to join the unity government with Benjamin Netanyahu in the Likud party. Uh, Gantz has been sworn in now as the Speaker of the Knesset, and the reports are that uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu will serve as Prime Minister for 18 months, and then Mr. Gantz will take over for the remaining two and a half years of the four-year Knesset session. Uh, How big of a surprise was it, and uh, do you think that Mr. Netanyahu has maybe more up his sleeve than the media has reported so far? Well, everybody in Israel, well, not everybody, 80% of the people in Israel know he has something up his sleeve. <laughs> he's not going to, he's not going to allow Gantz to be the prime minister. He's going to, he has enough time to uh, basically uh, either throw Gantz out or have him thrown out. And that's what he's going to do. He's, what he did right now was in, in the political eyes are brilliant because he actually moved Gantz away from the blue and white. So the people in the blue and white are very upset with him if it's yeah. Lapid and the other people. So he can't return to them. They'll never believe him. So he's, he's at a point right now that he can't go back, and he can't really uh, form a, a government with Netanyahu, not the way he wants to. And Netanyahu said, I'll give you, uh, you know, good positions, good seats. It looks like it's going to be a large parliament, 34 seats. But having said that, um, Gantz is not getting the positions he wants, and there is a big argument about it right now. Netanyahu, uh, for him, he doesn't care because he's a year and a half, doesn't start until this uh, signature doesn't happen. Uh, most people don't think it's going to happen before Passover. It's probably going to happen after, uh, if it even happens. He has uh, time till next week. To uh, he has a mandate from the president of Israel uh, to form his government. His, it, Netanyahu is waiting for that mandate mandate to finish in order to gain more power over Gantz. Most people think it's. Uh, I can't use a different word. It's a dirty trick. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Well, we'll watch what happens with great interest. Uh, Passover begins uh, next Wednesday, April 8th. How will these uh, restrictions on movement in Israel affect the Passover? Well, Benjamin Netanyahu said that he, he doesn't want people going out for the Passover Seder. He wants some people to stay at home, uh, use Zoom, use Skype uh, to, you know, to have dinner with your families. What he's saying is oh, my, the family members should be the ones that are home. You don't go to your grandparents, don't go, you don't move around. So it's going to be a different Passover. Hopefully, our ministry is going to have an opportunity via Skype and via Zoom to reach many, many people during this Passover season. I think it's a time where God is going to speak to the people, where people are going to start to see that, you know, stop putting your, uh, your trust in the stock market or in your work or in the bank. It's time to put your trust in God because you, you see that overnight, just in one night, this thing, the world has turned over. Yes. Uh, rabbi Zev Porat works from Tel Aviv. He's a messianic rabbi. Messiah of Israel Ministries is his ministry. His website, ZevPoretMinistries.com. There will be a link in the description below this video. You'll sa- see links to his YouTube channel there, so you can get his reports from Israel. He also appears regularly on Freedom Friday with our good friend, Pastor Carl Gallops. He's also very kindly linked to some of our past interviews at Skywatch TV there at his website. Again, that's Zev Porat Ministries. Uh, Zev, Sorry we won't see you this month, but uh, we pray that the October tour will be uh, uh, still uh, on schedule. Uh, no changes in that yet. Uh, that We'll have more information in a couple of weeks on that. But uh, Zev, thanks for your time today, and uh, may God protect you, your wife, and your ministry. Thank you, and keep up the great work of uh, reaching the gospel. God, God is not going to give us a spirit of fear. We're going to continue to preach no matter what. Amen. So, uh, a lot changing. Again, this world is a whole lot different than it was just 90 days ago. We had a lot of things on our calendar that we thought, sure, we knew where we were going to be and when we were going to be there in 2020, and that's turning out uh, not to be the case. The Scottish Bible Prophecy Conference, we told you about that in uh, Troon, Scotland, April 24th through 26th, that has been canceled. The Future Vision 2020 Conference, that's Prophecy Watchers Conference for 2020, that is uh, that was scheduled for June 18th through 21st, that is... Um, Going to become a virtual conference. More details forthcoming from prophecywatchers.com. And by the way, uh, they just uh, posted the interview that uh, Gary Stearman 
graciously did with me on uh, our book veneration uh, we did one part of that a uh, couple of months ago part two of the interview was just released by prophecy watchers this week so check that out prophecywatchers.com. Um, we talk about the final couple of chapters in the book where we uh, examine the ufo phenomenon in light of the ancient cult of the dead kind of a different take on that i think and uh, gary being that uh, the ufo phenomenon is really one of his uh one of his things it's really what uh, led him down the path of study that he's had for years that's uh it, w- it was pretty cool i thought that interview turned out really well um the battle ready conference in san antonio june 25th through 28th uh just received word they'll make an official announcement sunday april 5th well by your time you're hearing this it will be sunday april 5th so you will have heard the announcement already earlier today that uh, that conference is also going to become a virtual conference and uh, there will be more information forthcoming from uh uh, uh, Adrian and Cindy Appleberry, the conference organizers. That's battlereadyconference.org. Uh, the True Legends Conference in Branson, July 10th through 12th. That also becoming a virtual conference. Uh, in fact, I've got uh, uh, I've got my uh, presentation uh, outlined and working on that now because we'll be recording that here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so you'll find more information on that in the days ahead at gen6.com. No decision yet about the uh, Skywatch TV Defender Conference uh, in late August. We will wait and see if the projections are correct and that uh, we are out of the woods of COVID-19 by late June. We pray that that's the case. Um, in September, we got a couple of conferences we have agreed to speak at. The first weekend in September, 4th through 6th, the Igniting a Fire Conference. Uh, that's from Hear the Watchmen. That'll be at the Riverside Hotel in Boise, Idaho. Donna Howell, Allie Anderson Henson, Stephen Bankars, Gans Shimura. And others, and I don't have that in front of me, sadly. <laughs> but uh, There'll be more information on that coming soon from HearTheWatchman.com. Uh, the Glacier Prophecy Summit, that was the Prophecy Cruise, uh, September 6th through 13th, that has been canceled. Obviously, right now, a bad time for people uh, trying to, uh, you know, considering a cruise. So, uh, the Glacier Prophecy Summit, that is uh, now off the schedule for this coming year. Uh, however... September 18th through 20th, the Nephilim Again Conference. We will be there with uh, Ellie Marzilli, Russ Dizdar, and our colleague from Skywatch TV, Drew Graffia. Also, uh, Chief Joseph Witherland, w- Riverwind, Gary Stearman from Prophecy Watchers, and more. Uh, there may be some taped video appearances, but uh, we're praying that by September, things will be safe for travel again. The Skywatch TV Tour of Israel in October. Uh, decision on that will be made later in April. As we see how things are going, obviously, with things the way they are now in Israel and uh, here in the U.S., travel just not not advisable. Uh, But we'll see by October how things go. We'll make a decision, though, before the end of April on the tour. Uh, For more information, if you're curious about the itinerary and the optional extension or the separate eight-day tour of Sardinia, uh, log on to skywatchinisrael.com, skywatchinisrael.com. So, next week in this program, we talk with, uh, believe it or not, legendary rocker Tommy James, you know, and the Shondells. Yeah, Tommy James and Pastor Casper McLeod had a wonderful conversation with them uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, Casper has posted this already on his uh, website. Uh, wanted to give him first dibs because, after all, it was his program, but uh, allowed me to record it as well. So, we'll be giving you the audio next Sunday night, April 12th. Tommy James really knows his Bible prophecy, and obviously so does Casper. So it was an honor to have that conversation with him. Um, Big fan of his music, but it's a little surprising you realize that some of the songs that he wrote that uh, hit the Billboard charts back in the day actually um, are about the gospel or various aspects of the faith. So, uh, Tommy James, Pastor Casper McLeod, next Sunday night here on A View from the Bunker, which is a production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. Our opening theme, Iron Bacon, by Kevin McLeod. His website, www.incompetech.com. Our announcer is DC Good. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. (laughs) 